Welcome to a lecture on graphs in UMBC's Data 601. Uh, my name is Ben. To get started, I wanted you to review the expectations that you wrote down at the one of the initial classes in this lecture. Uh, you wrote down what it is that you thought you wanted to get about get out of this class and what you thought we were going to do. So I want you to revisit those. And then I want you to sort of think about, you know, whether those have been met and what you would want to get out of the rest of the semester. So there's a few lectures left and the topics are set, but I have some flexibility in what we cover. So if you have uh, topics that are important to you or topics that you think we should cover, you should let me know that and then I can alter potentially the course to fit your needs. So. Tell me what it is that you think would make a complete 601 class, and we'll work together on that. As an example, uh, if you're curious about visualizations, you could be specific about, I want more re review of the basics. Maybe I want to know what's possible, um, or maybe we want to get into like uh, geographic analysis or some other topic. So. If you say visualizations, my natural response is, what do you mean by visualizations? All right, so our lecture will be covering the topic of graphs. Um, so this is a picture of some points and lines, and it makes uh, a very somewhat noisy graph of uh, with, with what we normally call a hairball. So it's sort of incomprehensible. So we'll sort of have to deal with large-scale data analysis uh, and the visualizations often break down for that. There's a few topics left, so scaling up and elasticity are the planned topics, although as I mentioned I'm flexible as to whatever needs you have and topics you want to cover. For project two, uh, the Notebooks should be submitted on um, a blackboard. And then I am going to take your notebooks and post them on GitHub. So I can either have your name associated with the notebook or you can remain anonymous. But in either case, my plan is to put the notebooks, uh, make them available on GitHub. And then we will take those notebooks and uh, analyze them in class. So we've covered a few data, structure, data structures like lists and tables, and so we'll be introducing a new data structure called a graph. So we'll want to know when would we want to, want to use a graph and how do we visualize a graph, and then what do we do with a graph that's useful. So our first topic is what is a graph in the first place? It's a very reasonable question because the topic, the word gets used in many different senses. In data science, there's uh, a few that we care about. So as I mentioned, the word graph uh, here is going to refer to a specific data structure. So to review the data structures we've already seen, we have things like list, where the list contain uh, strings or integers or even other lists or other data structures. And we have tuples, which are sort of uh, items that are ordered and consistent. And we have dictionaries and scalars and strings and tables. So those are sort of the, the main sort of structures we've seen so far. So starting with a table, we might have information like uh, the relation between two different people. And that information may not only include the fact that there's a relation, but also maybe something like a duration. Right? So like these two people have known each other for a certain number of years. That's something that we could definitely see in a table. Um, and we might eventually want to represent as a graph. So we can have more complicated relationships. So maybe there is a person who is related to a company that they are employee of, and maybe there's a, a description of what that person does at the company and, and so there's like a, a, a relationships are a very common concept that we want to capture 
and tables are definitely one way of doing that, but uh, they may not be as rich uh, for querying. So I'm going to sort of with that motivation describe sort of the abstract content, the abstract concept of a graph, and then we'll get into how we can use graphs to describe relationships. So on the left here, I've got a picture of what we'll call nodes and edges. So the edges are the things that are lines between these big circles, and the circles that are labeled with letters are our nodes. So that's nodes and edges is one way of describing it. Another sort of way of describing it is a vertex and then link. So like depending on which community you're in, whether it's like data science or statistics or social sciences or mathematics, you may hear different uh, words to describe the same concept. But in the end, there's a picture that looks like this. That is what a graph is. So usually what we care about is a list of all the nodes. So here I've got the list of the labeled letters. And then the thing between the nodes, our relationships, are called edges. And so those might be like tuples in a list. So that's sort of like the common way of describing the content of a graph, but there's also a visualization that goes with that. Again, even the word graphs isn't consistently used. So like there are nodes and edges and there are links and vertices. Uh, there are also different words for graphs. So another word would be networks. So you may have heard of like the uh, network of people that you know, or the social network, right? These are the things that we think of having relationships, but the word graph is more typical in the mathematical context. Okay, so typically we don't work with uh, pictures. Usually we work with a, a data structure that is, it looks sort of like a table, but it's somewhat distinct. And the distinction from a table is that we have a list of all of the nodes up here on top, all the circles. And then we have that same list on the other axes. So the rows and columns are both just a list of the nodes. And then the thing that sits uh, in, inside the table, of the, con the content of the table is some indicator uh, for whether or not an edge exists. So here I've highlighted the ones just to sort of highlight to you that there are entries. And this is called the adjacency matrix. So this is not exactly a table. It's sort of like a numerical uh, structure that looks like a table. So what you can sort of find interesting here is that there is a symmetry, the symmetry about the diagonal. So the reason for that symmetry along this diagonal is because the the fact that there is a edge between A and B, so here we have from A to B, is the same thing as having an edge from B to A. So these are sort of independent of the direction. So between these two, there is one edge, but that's represented by two entries in the adjacency matrix. So that's sort of like a, a check that you can perform. If you say that the direction of the edge does not matter, therefore the values should be symmetric about the diagonal. Usually uh, the other reason that that matters is that if you have a really big matrix, like so big that it would take up all of your computer's memory, you can save half of the storage capacity by only writing down, say, the upper half of this matrix. And you know that the lower half of the matrix is actually the same. So again, it can save you some space if you can take advantage of the fact that there is a symmetry here, and then you only write down half the matrix. Right. So as I mentioned, now that we sort of have some grasp of what a graph is, what is, and you know, you'll hear, you hear the word graph sort of used interchangeably with words like plot and chart and figure. And it turns out that basically all of these things, the thing that I was referring to with nodes and edges has the same name as a graph, right? And so like all of these having the same name 
causes some confusion. Uh, so uh, it's not worth sort of like trying to establish what is the right answer. Um, so you always almost have to ask the people you're talking with, when you say the word graph, do you mean a thing that looks like this or something that looks like this? So uh, it really depends on the community that you're in, whether it's a bunch of sort of business people who think about pie charts or some mathematicians who think about nodes and edges. But these words are used interchangeably. All right, so now that we've sort of recognized that what we're working with is a graph, and there's an equivalent representation called an adjacency matrix, why do we have to do uh, these two different representations? And like, what's, what's the point of having two different things referring to the same idea? So the reason that one would use a graph in the first place is that it sort of alters the way in which I think about problems, right? So if I really am worried about relationships between things, then what I care about is the is not is usually not a table based representation. A graph is to me a more intuitive representation of relationships. And maybe a table is convenient if you care about simple relationships, but the complexity of like um, a business and a person and a person in a family and a person in a family having a role. Uh, these different relationships get pretty complicated, and so like having a graph description of those relationships can be useful. Uh, the other sort of like difference with a table is that often you'll want to have the table fully filled in with values, um, even if, but that doesn't always reflect whether or not there's a relationship there. So a graph is a, a little bit more convenient representation sometimes of what the relationships are. And of course, it makes pretty pictures, which maybe if you're selling something to management, that's what matters. Right. So the, there is some problems, right? Like having a new data structure means you have to learn new things. And the visualization of a graph can sometimes be very messy. So even though it might be easier to think in terms of, the visualization may not add a lot of value. So now we'll talk about some applications of why to use a graph. So as an example, um, if I were a credit card vendor and I was say Visa, and I had a person who was defrauding me of money. So they were basically using a credit card um, in ways that I did not attend. Uh, I don't want to understand, are there other people who have this type, same type of behavior? So if I have a, a fraudster and they're buying from certain vendors, um, do I see that same sort of pattern with other customers? So that would be an example of finding the way in which a fraudster relates to the vendors might be might appear very distinct from the way that they that a normal customer relates to those same vendors. So they can identify unusual behavior. So maybe a normal customer, for example, doesn't interact with hundreds of stores in the same hour. Right? That might be an example of a behavior that is an indicator of unusual behavior. So another use case for graphs is that um, if you want to understand the relationship between words in a text, uh, you can sort of graph what the, the, the relation is and perhaps extract some new insight that you didn't have otherwise. Um, probably the most common and widely spread uh, use case for graphs is in social network analysis. So this is because humans typically care about other humans um, for various reasons, right? One is maybe to sell a product, maybe to sell advertising, to sell sort of indicators of your behavior, and, and so like, uh, you know, hopefully maybe you've heard of Facebook and you realize that what's really for sale on Facebook is the relation that you have with your friends so that, in, and, and your, and your behavior patterns. 
so that people who want to sell you things can buy that information about you and then sell you ads based on the relationships that you have. So um, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to sort of like look around the internet and find places that are selling consumer data. And then you start to realize, wait, I'm in that consumer data. They're selling my identity. So it's, it's a little bit scary, but um, that's how advertising uh, with computers seems to work out. Um, like I said, it's pretty easy to find examples of this being used and how it's being used. So it's, it shouldn't be too much of a mystery, but I think most people have not thought about where their data ends up. All right, let's do some visualizations. Actually, let's do the exciting stuff, right? <laughs> so the first sort of note that I wanted to make is that these two graphs, the one on the left-hand side here and the one on the right-hand side, are equivalent. So usually we don't um, prescribe any meaning to the location of the nodes, unless we're doing sort of a geographic graph. But here, the A and B have a relationship, and they're not connected to anything else. That is the same over here as A and B have a relationship and they're not connected to anything else. So these two graphs are equivalent um, and also the distance of uh, the length of the, the edge does not typically matter. There are of course certain exceptions to that, but um, the layout is typically not the key point. I should say, uh, Having a good layout of the graph does make it easier to read. So for instance, if you look at F and M here, they're pair connected, but that's more obvious over on the right-hand side. So in some sense, the layout makes it easier to understand the graph, um, even if they are equivalent. All right. So graphs are pretty important and they're complicated, and so it shouldn't maybe surprise you that they have their own language. Uh, so the language that is pretty easy to get started with is called dot. So I'll show you an example of that. Happily, there's a Python module for the dot language called graphviz, high graphviz. Um, and we'll take a look at that as an example. Right, so I'm going to run pygraphviz and I'm going to install that into Python. And then I'm going to uh, create a new graph. So once I've got the uh, graph viz, I'm going to import the graph module. So with that function, it takes an argument. I'll pass it the round table. And then I'm going to assign the output of that to a new variable named RTG. So RTG is the name of the graph. And on that graph, I'm going to add a node and the node has a label, A, and I'm going to put a string associated with that node called King Arthur. I'm going to repeat this for a few other nodes. B is going to be Sir Bevedere the Wise, and L is going to be Sir Lancelot the Brave. And then I want to associate some edges. So I want A and B to be associated, and A and L to be associated. I'm going to make uh, another edge there, B and L. And then I want to see what the dot language looks like. So now I've constructed this graph, and I look at the source code for that graph. It looks like there's A and B and L, and I've got some edges, A, B, A, L, and B, L. So that's what the graph uh, language dot looks like. Now we can use that to actually produce a PNG, and then I can display that PNG in uh, Python, or in, in Jupyter, rather. So this is basically a method to make a PNG using GraphViz. So GraphViz is that library that we imported. And then once I've got the PNG on, on the file, then I can run the ipython.display command to actually produce the PNG in my notebook. So that picture was generated from the source code that we were looking at here. Okay, so now let's make another graph where we have spam and we've got uh, 
couple nodes and edges. And I'm going to basically run the same thing over here. And I can change what the display looks like there. So this should be uh, relatively straightforward to understand that you have people and you have relations and they're captured visually. Okay, so PyGraph is, is what we're using there. Um, another library is called PyDoc. Um, so here I'm, I'm going to show, so basically up here we didn't use too much sort of Python functionality because we we're just statically creating the nodes and edges. Down here I'm using PyDot to actually um, leverage the integration between Python and PyDot so that I can sort of declare this edge once and then put it inside of a Python loop and add that edge multiple times. I can do the same thing down here. And in the end, what I get is this relatively large graph. So it's sort of is constructed using a combination of Python and dot. So that's pretty powerful. So it means you can make very large graphs with just a little bit of code. All right, let's go back to our notes. All right, time for a quiz. Okay, this quiz won't actually count towards your, uh, your, your grade for the lecture, and there are a few quizzes in this lecture, but they're not graded. So the first question is, given this undirected graph, can you identify what the uh, value is under this orange square? So I'll give you a moment to look at that. You can pause the video if you want. So let's work our way through how did we get the answer of zero. So we happen to remember that this is an undirected graph and we recognize that everything along the diagonal is symmetric. And so it's because there is no edge between B and C, right? the thing that connects B and C is nothing. So that's a zero there. And because of the symmetry, we know that this should also be a zero. There's no connection between C and B and there's no connection between B and C and B here. The other sort of cool thing to think about is that there is a non-zero entry here at the D to D because there's a self-connected sort of uh, loopback connection there. All right, so now we understand undirected graphs. Let's take a look at another library called Network X. I'm going to use matplotlib and network x. And as with uh, graph viz, we'll start with just creating a graph and then adding a node. And then we can add a list of nodes and add some edges between the nodes. And then we'll sort of plot what that looks like. So I've got, we added node 1, and then we added nodes 2 and node 3. And we added one edge between 1 and 2. So that's what we sort of see here is we have these labeled nodes. Notice we didn't have to specify what the labels were, they were just sort of automatically entered as integers, so that was useful. Given that matrix, uh, so given that uh, that graph, we can create the adjacency matrix for that graph, and we have three nodes, and so therefore uh, we have a three by three matrix, and there are edges from uh, 1 to 2, and 2 to 1. So we can add a few edges. So when we add 3 to 2 and 1 to 3, and we get a completely connected graph. And the uh, adjacency matrix for that is 1's everywhere except for the diagonal. So the fun thing about Network X is it's sort of a graph analysis tool, and so it comes with a few existing graphs. I'm going to make a totally random graph, something that I just had no idea what was going to happen. It's basically, I tell it how many nodes there are and what is the probability of a connection between any two nodes. And so that's what we get. It's just a random graph. 
and I can show with labels. And I can get the, uh, the matrix for that is this gigantic matrix showing the adjacency matrix for this picture. Okay. So we can square the, uh, the matrix. So we can multiply the matrix by itself. And then we'll understand uh, how many uh, edges there are between uh, adjacent nodes. The square of an adjacency matrix, when you multiply it by itself, uh, takes the number of walks between any two nodes. So if I wanted to get from, say, 8 to 1, um, how many walks are there? How many edges are there? We can make an even larger graph, and this is now sort of starting to look like the uh, first slide that we looked at in the lecture where we have a hairball. It's almost unreadable. So that's pretty standard. We can look, so what we're going to show is a different layout. So the same graph, we're going to lay out slightly differently. Now it looks more like a bird's nest. Right? So this is just the same set of nodes laid out with all their edges. Also still mostly unreadable here. This is where like having uh, the adjacency matrix ends up start, starting to be useful because this is not that helpful, but the manipulations that you're going to do are typically involving the, uh, the adjacency matrix. So uh, another cool thing that we can do with network X is we can ask what are all the different path lengths between different pairs. Um, and so if we looked at this um, giant graph and we wanted to ask how to get from 14 to 57, maybe they're directly connected, or maybe from 14 to 57 we have to go through some other node. And so if we ask how, what is the longest path between any two pairs, we can do a little bit of uh, calculation to figure out what is the maximum path length. So uh, we'll talk about Kevin Bacon uh, when we get back to the slides. But just another little feature that you can do, you can pull up other graphs, like a lollipop graph. So here's here's the sucker and here's the stick. All right, so why do we care about path lengths in a graph? Come back here. This is basically a, a measure of relationships in a community. So if you haven't heard of the idea of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, it's this game where you can find your relationship between any two people um, through uh, counting what the relationships that person has. So maybe if you know, I know a person at a gas station and the person at the gas station knows someone at a grocery store and the person at the grocery store knows a Hollywood producer and the Hollywood producer knows Kevin Bacon. So like uh, you should be able to get between any two people typically within six different connections. So it's a measure of how well connected the society is. All right, so that was, we've all spent all that time on just undirected graphs. So now we're gonna talk about directed graphs. It's a slight twist. The idea is basically that instead of the relation between A and B uh, going in both directions, maybe it goes just in one direction. So. Uh, here I see A going to B, and that is a directed graph. All right, so why would we care about a directed graph as compared to an undirected graph? Well, let's see some examples of where that becomes handy. Let's look at a uh, high call graph. We'll run this. So I have this function here uh, in Python where I have, uh, let's see, where do I start? I start with a cool function. So I start by calling this, and then within that a cool function, I'm calling print underscore me, so it's there. And then after I do some more work, I would call the function nice. So there's a starting point, it goes here, and then to these two functions. So there's this handy function called uh, handy library called PyCallGraph, which I can wrap 
my functions with PyCall Graph. And then when I want to view what that looks like, I have this handy picture. So I have my main cell, which is sort of this big block of code here, calls a cool function, which calls these two functions. So that's sort of an interesting idea, right? We can see which functions depend on which other functions. And that's a directed graph because our my main code cell calls a cool function, which calls these two. So it's not a, a uh, it is a directional graph. So where this becomes handy is typically when you show up at a new job, you'll be handed this giant code base that's a, it's a real mess of like functions calling other functions calling other functions, and you'll be like, how do I know what's going on? And then you'll be able to use this handy dandy high call graph to see what the relationships are between the function ones within Python. So this is sort of a way of understanding what it is that your code is doing and where it is spending time. Right. So that was uh, one example of a directed graph that you might use. Another sort of uh, cool application, in my opinion, is using that graph viz as a directed graph uh, to analyze what's on your computer. So I'm going to use GraphViz and a library called Glob. So Glob is uh, the ability to go off on your file system and figure out what all the files are. So I'm going to ask Glob, what are the different files that I have in my directory? So it's going to give me back a list of the files and some folders. So here's these are all files, right? So networkx.ipymb. And then I have a folder called not used, and it has some files in it. And then I have another folder with some more files in it. So that's that's it's useful. Okay, I have a list of all the things on my computer. But it doesn't support hidden directories. So I went and I wrote a function that uh, actually does look at all the hidden files and folders. So it's all the same things that we got back from Glob. Um, except now there's like a .ipymb checkpoints folder, which is normally hidden. So now it sees all the things. All right, so I want to take that information and I want to make it not some giant text output, but an actual uh, uh, graph. I want to visualize what that looks like. And so here I wrote a function that I'm going to get the uh, current location and directory names and the file names in the list. And once I have that, I can make a graph out of it. So I'm going to show you what the graph looks like, and then we'll come back. Uh, so it's just the point here is, remember, I wanted to declare my nodes and declare my edges. So in this case, nodes are going to be either files or folders. And then edge is going to be uh, the relation between a folder and a file. Right? A folder contains a file, so it will be an edge. So I'm just sort of showing that this is where we're going to build on top of is the same sort of idea, except instead of people, we'll have files and folders. All right, so again, I'm going to now combine that giant list of files and folders that I had up here with the ability to identify nodes and edges. So that's what this code block does. I'll come back to that. Um, so we'll make a PNG out of that and then display what the PNG is. So our first problem is this is a really big picture. It has like all of these files and folders. Right, so if I go all the way over here, this is like my top level directory has some files in it here. And then let's see, one of these files here. This is a now a folder, IPYMB checkpoints, and that folder has some files in it. But this is almost unreadable. It's this giant graph that is hard to see. So what we can do is we can change the orientation of that graph. So instead of being a default top-down graph, I'll make it a left-right graph. So it's going to change the sort of layout. And now I can see this pretty clearly, right? So this is, again, all the files and folders that I have on my in my directory laid out um, from a left-right orientation. And it's actually pretty readable. All right, so what did we do there? So we took um, our current directory and we sorted through all the directories and the directory names and the file names um, in our current location. 
and then I looked in the subfolders and files and I added those as nodes and edges. So the nodes go between the directory that I'm in and the, and the other folder or the directory that I'm in and the file. Right. And then I wrote all of that to a file and I made a PNG and that's what we're looking at now. Okay, so this isn't the only orientation. You can do other things that are slightly less useful in my opinion, like circo. Um, we'll look at the, what that layout looks like. So this is a circo layout. So again, it's just making giant circles. Not quite as useful in my opinion, but you know, might be more applicable for a social graph. And the last one that I'll look at is called Nido. So it doesn't quite adhere to the same sort of circles as strongly, but uh, again, it's not quite as useful in this context, but other cases it can be. So um, in this specific case, playing around with these, the left-right orientation for this files and folders layout looks the most useful, but it really depends on the density of your graph and, and the relationships present. Okay, so that's two applications of the directed graph visualization. So where you might more commonly see uh, a graph is something like a search engine. And a search engine is basically doing the same thing I just showed with files and folders, except with links and hyperlinks in web pages. So every uh, web link that you go on, there's an algorithm that builds a giant graph, and it's called the page rank algorithm. And that page rank algorithm is asking uh, what are, what are the certain properties about the graph of links formed by the internet? So I wanted just to do a little sort of like side note here that uh, if you're curious about like how to actually do that, there are a couple of websites available. So like scrapethesite.com, go to that for a moment. So you can actually uh, s scrape the pages on this uh, website and look at all the links on it and then build a, a graph of all the links from all the pages, and then you'd have um, a data structure that would be appropriate to run the page rank out of month. Oh, I got it. All right, so there are websites available that are legal to scrape. They're actually built for it. And you have all the knowledge needed to do um, exactly what Google's doing, although their scale is a little bit larger. Okay, so previously um, we looked at the data structure called an adjacency graph for undirected graphs, and we saw some symmetry, right? So there was some symmetry along this diagonal axis. For a weighted graph, that's not true. There is no symmetry because here the, uh, the, the edge between G and H there is an edge between G and H, but there is not an edge that goes from H to G. So where we would see that, so from G to uh, H, there's nothing. And from H to G, which is, there should be, how did I get that wrong? Ah, from H to G, there is an edge. And from G to H, there is not. So this is the asymmetry that you see here. All right, so now that we sort of have seen adjacency graphs, let's do a little quiz, right? So this is number two. So if I have this adjacency graph and I have some directed edges, the question is, what would I see below this orange box? So a zero or a one. Give you a moment. And the answer is it's a zero. So there is, uh, so I have to figure out which one is the two and which one is the from. Right? So if I look at from two to one, nope, it must be the other orientation, right? Because it's going from one to two. So this side here is the from, and this is the two. So going from one to two, there is an edge. 
but there's nothing that goes from one so from sorry from two to one so there's nothing that goes in the opposite direction so that's a zero so a little check here so from zero from four to four there should be a one that's the diagonal there there is a one Same sort of question here. What is the value under the orange? All right, the answer is it's a one because we have from, uh, from three to zero, there is a directed edge, so we put a one there. All right, so we've spent in almost the entire lecture so far on hard hard technical skills. So I wanted to talk about a little bit of graph application for your soft skills. So when I am talking with peers, there's sort of like a an openness because they're in the same situation you are. Um, that might not apply to the case when you're talking to your boss. Your boss is a slightly different relation because they have more power and authority over you. They can tell you what to do, they can fire you. Right? And so that power disparity, um, it means that it's not an undirected graph. It, it is definitely a directed graph. There's some asymmetry in a relationship. And so that can, that can often be taken sort of in a negative light of like, oh, they have all this power over me. I'm fearful of what they could do, right? But it actually, um, it turns out it's also bad in the opposite direction, which is because of that power disparity, the, the leadership in your organization probably isn't getting the information they need. So as an example of that, if something was going wrong in the company, no one wants to deliver that bad news to the organization's management. And so that's actually a problem because how can management fix the problem if no one is delivering them the bad news? So this is the, uh, a really significant problem for leadership. And because of that power disparity, the low level people who actually know what's going on are unlikely to report any bad news to the leadership and, then ba and the leaders can't actually make any changes. So at the same time, the leaders don't always wanna be talking to the low level workers because it then looks like micromanagement, so that's bad. Right. And so uh, there's sort of like a routine interaction between leadership and employees, and it can sort of be harmful to both the, the people who are supposed to be making leadership decisions and the people who are trying to get their job done. So you may have heard of the idea of an elevator pitch, and the elevator pitch often goes uh, sort of like getting an idea across quickly to your leadership. But in light of what I just told you, um, I think there's more value that you can do in an elevator pitch. And the elevator pitch is um, telling your leadership things that they didn't expect to hear. Um, so often the, the truth of a situation might not be something that makes it up the chain of command. So like your boss has a boss and their boss has a boss and getting information up this sequence of relationships can be very difficult. So when you're sort of in a context, or usually a short exposure to someone who's in an important position, you wanna be able to tell them something that surprises them and that they find useful. So uh, this is one thing that you wanna think about um, in your position. If you ran into the C CEO of your company, what would you tell them, right? Would you tell them, hey, I'm having a great job. I really like this company. Like that doesn't add any value per se. Um, nor does complaining, right? So like, I can't get this job done. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, that's probably not what they want to hear either. And so finding something that is both useful and unique um, and something they may not have heard from other people is a way that you can get noticed um, in a positive sense. All right, so we have two more graphs. Um, I'm actually gonna skip over property graphs in this, uh, in this video and we'll come back to it in a separate video. So the last actual topic here in this sequence is the wave graphs. 
So an example of when I would need to use a graph might be flights or delivery trucks or delivering power, right? So all of these things, um, they have relationships where the relationship is a logistics feature like time or money or distance. Um, so then you have a question about like, how do I get my resources to where they need to go most effectively? And on some maps, very rarely, um, you'll see a table that looks like this. So this, uh, this is a list of distances between all pairs of cities, right? So like if I want to go between uh, Amarillo on this axis and Arlington, it's 349.6 miles. Right? So you can read that distance between the nodes. That's the distance between them. And there isn't a distance between Amarillo and Amarillo because it would be a zero. So they've only shown you half of this symmetric table. But this is an example of the edges having a property that's numeric, so we'll make it a weighted graph. All right. So where would I typically see this? Um, if I care about the distance between two locations, Google shows me not only what that distance is, but all the other routes. And so if you think about it, this is actually a really complicated problem. Right? So the modern equivalent is, I could go from the library to the post office, but there's more than one option to get there. So this is a link to how that gets done. But basically what they're doing is they break uh, the, the trip into multiple segments, and they say, how would I get from this point to some other distant point, and then how do I get from that distant point to the post office? And so it looks for a sequence of hops that are the shortest, and then it connects those as your fastest route. So it doesn't actually explore all the paths. If you think about how would I get from New York City to Los Angeles, there's a lot of different road, road choices. And so they, the Google Maps algorithm does not try all those different routes, it looks for sequences of routes that are collectively the shortest. Alright, as you might expect, you can have a weighted graph, and that shows up as an adjacency matrix where all of the edges are just numbers in the adjacency matrix, and there's symmetry here because this is undirected. To go a little crazier, you could have an undirected a uh, directed graph with weights, um, and then it would be asymmetry there. So that's sort of the level of craziness we can get to. And where would you use that? Well, maybe you have a dating website. And the dating website shows both interest, so maybe one group of people are interested in another group of people, and you have maybe topics of interest that are in your relation. So like how strongly um, does this person want the other person and is interested in the same topic? That might be a weighted directed graph. All right, one last quiz. So we have here a directed weighted graph. And the question is, what is the value in the square beneath the orange uh, rectangle? So because there is no connection between uh, 5 and 2, then the, the edge is 0. Right. So a few caveats that are um, pretty typical of any graph. Um, if you have a graph where all the edges uh, between all the nodes are connected, that's not a very useful graph typically. It's pretty noisy. And the visualization of graphs may not be useful, even though at small scale they're pretty and they're sort of helpful. Typically at the relevant scale of having any significant amount of data, the visualization becomes very messy. In addition to that, when you're making the graph, it can take a long time to make the visualization. So the visualization of a large graph may take you a long time, and it doesn't always add a lot of value. So just one little shout out here uh, before we finish up that uh, 
that you may see some use of the graphs in machine learning. So um, if your graph is missing some data or uh, you want to train your, your, your machine learning model based on graphs, that's a, it's an emerging field. I wouldn't say it's uh, widely used, but it is a thing that happens. Okay, and then one last shout out for the idea of when you leave this class, you will um, have formed relationships in the class. And so I would argue it's useful to maintain those relationships after you leave the class, because this is probably the most diverse group of data scientists you'll be exposed to in your career outside of conferences and meetups. So if you uh, have met other students and you wanna stay in contact with them, your UMBC email address might not be the best way. So I would recommend finding something like LinkedIn um, where you can uh, have social connections that are more professional in nature. All right, the homework for this week. Um, before we get to that, I do want an email uh, asking what it is that you already knew from this class, one thing that you did not know, and one thing that you wanted to know but wasn't described in this lecture. So send me an email with those, that's your task. And then there is a uh, reading assignment right to this slide. Uh, the, the homework though is to uh, look at your collection of notebooks used for Data 601. So you have a set of IP and IP, Y, and B files, and uh, I think you should have at least eight of those. And I want you to parse through that file and find code that starts with the word from or import. Those will be your import statements. And then I want, what I want back is a notebook that includes a list of all the modules used in your notebooks. That's all. Thanks for watching.